I think there is a, a EU foreign policy, except that it is not exactly what we usually think about the EU, uh, about the foreign policy. I think it is more complicated, more complex than the traditional uh, foreign policy because, <laughs> as we all know, uh, the European Union is a very specific organization or a political body that has no equivalent around the world. So if you talk, and I usually talk more about EU external action, it means um, an external action uh, that includes trade policy, uh, humanitarian assistance, um, development assistance, so on and so forth. And then you have also the more traditional elements of a foreign policy, namely how to solve crises, how to um, move into difficult conflicts to try to come up with a political solution. It is on the, what I would call the geopolitical leg of that external action, that maybe um, there are shortcomings and weaknesses, no doubt about it, up to the point when many of our partners think that Europe is not relevant at the moment. And if you look at the major political crises at the moment in the Middle East, um, um, in Africa and other parts of the world, you don't hear much about Europe. Um, it is, as I was saying previously, a very important uh, player in terms of humanitarian assistance. It is not a major player in terms of trying to find a solution, a political solution, and being there very much present on the ground. I think, for instance, about Syria. Uh, the countries that are involved at the moment in the, the um, search for a, a political solution, Russia, Turkey, Iran, the Astana group, as we uh, talk, as we mention usually, um, there is no European Union there at the moment. Um, on Libya, uh, it's more or less the same thing. You have more or less all the regional actors being involved, from Egypt to Saudi Arabia to the Emirati to Turkey. You don't hear much about Europe. That doesn't mean that some individual European member states are not being involved. France, Germany. Britain, maybe a few others, Italy, in, in the case of, um, of, um, of Libya. Um, but the EU as such, the full body entity, is not really there at the moment. And this is where I think a lot of work needs to be done to achieve a new geopolitical reality with Europe play, playing as a real global actor um, in that field, which is not the case currently. And it seems to me that today, after all this uh, set of crises, we're coming into a new area, as you were saying, with um, a new uh, leadership coming in. And what you hear today, the talk of the town today in Brussels, is all about Europe has to um, set up again its course, um, put its act together, and move forward as a new global actor. Um, the um, next uh, soon-to-be high representative, Mr. Borrell, is talking about how the European Union has to learn the language of power. Mm. President Macron uh, from France is talking about a new European sovereignty, um, a real strategic autonomy, so on and so forth. Mrs. Ursula von der Leyen, the new president of the European Commission, has talked about a commission that should be geopolitical. So all this is going in the same direction. Now the whole point is, will they be able to deliver? <laughs> and there we are only at the beginning of a, of a new, um, of a new uh, I would say, of a new round, of a new upsurge. Um, so it's very interesting to see how Europe has gone from ups to downs and up again. So this is a new cycle that is starting now, I think. Now it's more complicated on the geopolitical side because in my opinion, in order to become a real global player in that field, Europe has to, to um, solve what I would call its identity problem. You know, European members have never really decided whether they wanted to remain either mostly an economic player um, with no particular political clout or if they were ready to have a political role, then they didn't know exactly what they were looking for. 
Should we act as a, as a multilateral organization, or should should we be more of a hard-headed um, uh, na uh, nation um, uh, like uh, individual member states can be, and therefore really? picking up all the um, narrative and the mindset of a geopolitical player. And there you have a, a strong split among Europeans. Some countries, France being certainly in the lead, would like to see Europe as a real power, um, Europe puissance, as the French like to say. Uh, they may have the support of some of the few um, member states, but many others are very uncomfortable with that uh, notion and prefer to stick to a more low-profile Europe um, that would mostly um, work in the field of the um, economic challenges. Uh, so I think they have to overcome that crisis of identity, I would say. Um, how can they do it? Either by being all convinced that this is the way forward, or maybe, and you know, this is what we hear more and more, the need for a more flexible Europe. In other words, those who are really committed to move forward with um, this brand of um, Europe uh, as a geopolitical global player, then those who want to move forward along that road go ahead and the others stay behind if they don't want to go along. In fact, the treaty has already um, provisions uh, in its framework that allow for this. Uh, you have the possibility of going for um, uh, constructive abstention, as they say, uh, enhanced cooperation. In other words, a core group of countries decide to move along and go ahead and be more ambitious. The other ones stay behind, and if they want to join later, they can. Um, everybody so far, all the different member states, have been rather reluctant to go along that line. Uh, but maybe time has come to um, use these provisions of the treaty and to see how it uh, unfolds. It's interesting because I think all three countries you had just mentioned, America, China and Russia, certainly would say that um, Europe is needed, um, is needed as a, as a global player. Uh, uh, but once this statement has been uh, delivered, um, what exactly should that Europe as a global player be, then I think differences would be uh, emerge immediately. For America, they would, uh, for the US, um, they would like to have a European Union, um, as President Trump would say, that would pay its due part, uh, uh, its um, due part of the total burden uh, for NATO or for um, other um, military interventions, for instance, or so on and so forth. So a reliable ally um, that um, uh, put its money where its mouth is and uh, that stops uh, uh, lagging behind or dragging behind. Uh, for Russia, definitely, they would like to see Europe as a, as a, as a major player, but one that precisely could move away from an exclusive alignment with America, uh, uh, because this is what Russia has been hoping for, for for many years. As for China, I think what they would be looking for with a, with a, a strong European leadership is to support them in their confrontation with, uh, with uh, the United States. Uh, so uh, if you put all this together, it makes a rather complex <laughs> uh, image and um, an objective that is very difficult to reach. Um, so for the Europeans, at the end of the day, it's about how to reconcile all these different requests uh, that are being put uh, to the Europeans and try to find a sort of common ground uh, that allows European to catch up and reconcile all these uh, different partners, which means at the end, that Europe must find its own independent voice um, and that it must be able uh, to feel strong enough uh, to come out and speak on its own for its own interest, um, which means maybe um, a union uh, that would be more agile, more flexible, uh, taking more account about its own interest 
maybe a little bit less messianic as it has been in the past, where it has championed human rights, democracy, up to the point where some of its partners uh, feel that um, uh, the Europe, this kind of Europe, is not very far and very different from uh, the US as the champion of regime change. Uh, so the Europeans have to find a new, a new profile, a new narrative, I would even say a new mindset. Um, uh, they have to change to some extent their DNA. One must never forget, and I think this is one of the problems we face with Europe, is that when Europe started, when the whole European project was launched in, in the 50s and the mid-50s, it was all set up and based upon the idea that Europe was going to free itself from precisely these power impulse um, which had brought so much harm to the European Union because of the two world wars. So that was enough of the uh, conflict and the wars between France and Germany, Germany and Britain. Um, we should become a united group uh, that threw out any idea of power and that was looking for something totally new, a new brand of uh, multilateralism much closer to what President Wilson, uh, after the First World War, was thinking about. There was definitely a Wilsonian um, spirit and mindset in the uh, first construction of the European Union. By the way, it left totally aside very quickly anything related to foreign policy or defense or security, and it focused entirely on economic matters. It only went back to foreign policy starting in the early 70s, but mostly with Maastricht, which means 1992. So this is an uh, added uh, element to the construction of the European Union, and maybe to some extent something that doesn't fit very easily in the narrative of the early years of the European Union. It is moving the European Union a little bit away from its turf, and its natural ground, which was, I would say, to some extent, um, uh, a ungeopolitical and far away from all the natural um, or the uh, traditional struggles uh, between full-fledged geopolitical powers. Uh, uh, so it's a whole new lessons that the European Union uh, have to learn. Yes, and I think for many of the uh, European Union members, uh, member states, uh, they accept that uh, without any difficulty. France may be one of the few which has always find it difficult. Uh, uh, they, you know, uh, uh, the French like to repeat time and again their very old slogan, um, with the United States, we are a close friend, a deep ally, but we're not aligned. <laughs> We can have our own thinking, our uh, independent mind um, uh, set if we, if we want to. Um, but France is to a very large extent um, a nation very much on its own compared to the other European Union members. The problem today for the European Union um, is precisely that one, is that they have remained very close to the United States and they all wish to do so, whereas they have um, uh, uh, distance themselves from China and from Russia, even if they're trying to implement a, a genuine dialogue with these two countries. But definitely we are on board with the Americans in this transatlantic partnership, which is at the core of the whole European idea. And now the problems we're facing is that we detect um, in uh, Washington, noises, uh, rumors, uh, statements even, that seem to uh, um, embody something that should look like a drift from the Americans away from Europe towards Asia, in what is in fact a natural way um, of um, adapting uh, America to the new realities. Um, Today, Americans' trade is uh, uh, to a large extent with Asia. Uh, its interests are there. 
China is the main competitor, and therefore you see this Asian pivot that started with uh, uh, President Obama that is still very much there. And it seems to me that one of the main challenges the Europeans are facing is that they are a bit in denial of reality, and they don't want to see this um, change, this drift, um, this um, this movement uh, that we're witnessing at the moment, and they're still hoping that uh, uh, it will be business as usual and that nothing will really change. Um, the fact is, even if I think the transatlantic alliance is here to stay, the, um, the nature, um, the dimension, um, the way it is organized, the functioning of this alliance may have to change with the Europeans accepting to take um, a greater share of the burden um, and to some extent uh, accepting to act in a more autonomous way. That doesn't mean that we're going to uh, uh, get rid of that alliance. Nobody wants to, not even the French, uh, but that we should go for some deep adaptation, transformation of that alliance.